Welcome to Sure Foundation Lutheran Church's podcast channel. The following sermon was preached on January 28th, 2024 on the basis of Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. Our gospel reading and also our sermon text today from Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 21. They, meaning Jesus and his disciples, went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the word of God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, some teachers are just different. They're just better. You can't sometimes verbalize why. You can't always verbalize why they're better than some of the other teachers that you have, but you just know it. They, they speak with such confidence. They speak with such clarity. They speak with a clear mastery over whatever they happen to be teaching, and they, they, even though they're very intelligent, they know how to communicate those things to you so that you can learn. And with every sentence that they speak, it, it's awesome because you feel like you are adding to your learning through them. The, the world is full of teachers like these. I, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that as I even gave that description, you're maybe thinking of some of your past teachers that you've, you've had, who, who you cherish and who you, who you remember being exactly like this, incredibly talented. You learned a lot from them. And we can thank God for, for teachers with those gifts and talents because they are a blessing to such a wide array of people. But for every talented teacher that you've had, you've likely also had teachers that weren't so talented. In fact, you probably had some teachers that really didn't seem to know what they were talking about. And there maybe was a variety of reasons for that. Maybe uh, they didn't have the time to prepare, maybe they, maybe they were lazy in their preparation, um, maybe they didn't have the knowledge base or the training to, to succeed in that way, or maybe they just didn't have the it factor to, to teaching. Maybe that just wasn't a, a gift of theirs, but you could kind of pick up on, on that fact pretty quickly, and as you listen to them, you have rather low confidence in what they are, are saying. There's obviously a lot of different factors when it comes to teaching, but, but two things seem to be very important. Number one, the ability of the teacher, and number two, the content that they are teaching. Both are important, and, and having both together is a, is a great recipe for success. Jesus is with his disciples now in Capernaum. He had started his ministry. He, he is not very far into his public ministry at this point, he had started in some of the smaller towns around Galilee. Nazareth, you might remember him turning the water into wine at Cana. But now, he, he and his disciples had moved to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was still in Galilee, but it was on the Sea of Galilee, and it was this, this bustling town that had a bigger population. Jesus is going to be able to, to reach more people and talk to more people in Capernaum. And it happens to be the Sabbath in Capernaum, so it's, it's Saturday. Their Sabbath was, was Saturday, right? And if you were in Jerusalem on the Sabbath, you'd go to the temple. But if you were anywhere away from Jerusalem, you would go to a synagogue. Uh, it was kind of like their, their church at that time. And what you'd, what you'd expect to find in a synagogue is you'd, you'd find somebody reading an Old Testament reading. You'd find people joining together in prayer. The synagogues at that time were mostly in the control of the Pharisees. You, know, you might know a little bit about the, the Pharisees. Uh, but it didn't necessarily mean that there would be a Pharisee at each place. They were just kind of the overseers of, of all of these different synagogues. And so as you entered the synagogue, you'd expect 
either a Pharisee or someone who was considered an expert in the law, they would be reading the Old Testament reading, and then they would provide somewhat of a sermon on, on that Old Testament reading, but also based on some of the rabbinical commentaries of the time. So rabbis would, would make commentaries about the Old Testament readings, and a lot of times they'd add rules and laws onto what the, the Bible had said. And so that's a lot of times what the experts in the law would read on, on Sunday mornings, and the people would, would come and listen and join together in prayer. Well, if ever there was a, a, a traveling rabbi, if there was somebody visiting that was a rabbi at that time, uh, they'd be invited a lot of times to come and, and do the Old Testament reading and to provide a message for the people. And so Jesus, he's, he's a rabbi, he's a teacher, right? That's what, that's what rabbi means, teacher. He was often asked to function in that capacity, and in Capernaum, this was no different. Jesus was asked to read the Old Testament scriptures and to give a message. Oh, what it would be like to have been in that synagogue in Capernaum that day. But we're not told what he said. We, we don't get specifically what he said, but we get the reaction of the crowd to what he said. Did you catch it? They were amazed. They were amazed at his teaching. In fact, it's probably safe to say that they hadn't heard a, a teaching like this before. They were used to hearing the teaching of the experts in the law, but, but Jesus came with a, a different sounding message. You know, the message that they would hear most of the time from these experts in the law were the, the rules and the regulations from the Old Testament. But, like I mentioned before, the rabbinical commentaries, they, they added a lot of rules and regulations on to these things. Things that, that people needed to do to be good people, quote unquote. Uh, things that people needed to do to be on God's good side. That was essentially the, the message that people were hearing at these synagogues from, from week to week. And this teaching was like stale bread compared to what Jesus brought to the people. Because Jesus brought a message of both law and gospel. He didn't stop with the law, but he certainly did preach the law. We're not told exactly what he said here, of course, but we know what Jesus was saying at times like this when he was in different places. He would start by urging people to repent, to turn away from that, their sinful lifestyle, whatever they were doing, the sexual immorality, greed, uh, lack of respect for authority. He would speak very specific law to them so that they would admit freely from their hearts that they are, are sinners. But for a lot of people that were, were listening in those synagogues, the admitting that they were a sinner part was not the hard part for them. <laughs> because week after week, they had heard from the experts in the law. From week after week, they were reminded uh, how they hadn't kept that law, how they hadn't been obedient and they came to the synagogue and they, they had that realization that they hadn't been obedient. And they left with resolve that they were going to try harder and do better the next week. But inevitably, they'd find themselves back at that synagogue the next week, hearing the, the expert in the law read the law to them again, and, and still feeling the guilt and shame from all of the previous weeks. And now even more this week, it was piled on, on top of them. They knew they were sinners. Because they had heard the law. But now the, the preaching that Jesus came with did not stop with the law. Jesus certainly confronted them in their sin. But then when they were thirsty for something, Jesus gave them the gospel. The people maybe didn't know that that's what they were thirsty for at the time. But, but then Jesus preached to them the gospel and this was like a cool drink of water for a thirsty person because Jesus came to tell them that they didn't have to be obedient to the law because, in fact, they couldn't be obedient to the law. They did not have that within them. They could not submit to God's law. In fact, by nature, they were hostile to God. And so Jesus came to be their obedience. He came to be their champion, that, that he would be righteous so that they would be righteous so that they would have his obedience, so that they would be forgiven, so they would have the hope of everlasting life. Jesus came to bring them relief. Week after week, they, they were piled on with shame and guilt, and Jesus came to just 
take that right off of their shoulders and give them peace to preach the gospel. It's essential that we hear both. You and I, we need to hear the law. We need to hear that we are not holy, that we are not righteous. We need to take that law that we hear, we need to apply it to our own hearts so that we can readily admit that we are sinners. We need to have our sinful nature crucified within us. We need to be led to the point of despair, despair over our own good works and our own efforts. But then we need to hear the gospel. We need to hear that Jesus did it for us. We need to hear that Jesus took that burden off of our shoulders, forgave our sin, and gave us the hope of everlasting life so that we may have true peace. Praise Jesus when you get to hear both law and gospel because that's how the Holy Spirit works on a heart, convicting and healing, convicting and healing as a constant process throughout your life. When it comes to teaching, there seems to be two things that are important. One, the ability of the teacher, and two, the content of his message. Look at verse 22 again. It says, The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not the teachers of the law. Okay, so we've already talked about number two, the content of his teaching. The people were amazed because the content of Jesus' teaching was so much different than what they had heard from the experts in the law. It actually brought them real peace instead of feeling guilt and shame. But but they add another thing here. The ability of the teacher. Jesus' ability far surpassed any of that of the experts of the law. Because some teachers, they just have it, right? They're just different. They're, They're just better. You might not be able to verbalize why, but they just have a clear mastery over what they're teaching. They teach with such confidence and clarity, but it's not just that with Jesus. They add something here. They, they say, he teaches as one who has authority. This isn't just a talented teacher that, that has great abilities, that is incredibly knowledgeable. Certainly he was all of those things, but he taught as one who had authority. He, he didn't teach as if somebody was, was relaying a message through him He taught as the author of that message. In fact, Jesus was the embodiment of message. It's no no wonder John wrote what he did in John 1. He calls Jesus the Word because Jesus is the embodiment of that message. He is the Word. And he could speak with that authority as God. Now, the skeptic might say here, well, the, the people, they're, they're just brought in by persuasive speech, right? We're, we're not even told what he said specifically. We're just told the reaction of the crowd. So how can you judge the validity of someone's statements based on a reaction? Okay, fair enough. Let's keep going. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's right. Impure spirits, demons, the devil, they're real. I feel like I need to say that because we, uh, we, meaning we as a culture, right, we very quickly bypass some of those facts. We write that off as if it's something of the past and and not a real thing uh, today. But, But impure spirits... The demons, devil, the devil, they're real beings and they're really evil. And every time they show up in in Scripture, they they are trying to torment and wreak havoc on on people. That's their clear goal is just to to cause as much chaos as possible. And so Jesus is in the synagogue and all of a sudden this possessed man cries out. We're told he has this impure spirit, and the people who are there listening, they know immediately this man has an impure spirit, and he says something kind of interesting. He identifies Jesus as the Holy One of God. Is he wrong? No, he's not wrong. The the impure spirit is, is correct. Jesus is the Son of God, God in the flesh. He is eternal. There was never a a beginning or an end uh, to him. 
He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. That is, is who these people are looking at. The impure spirit correctly identifies him, but right before he identifies him, did you catch the question that he asked? He says, have you come to destroy us? Also an interesting question. The, the impure spirit knows who he's talking to. The impure spirit knows that Jesus has power, dominion, and authority over him. That, that no plan or purpose of, of any impure spirit, demon, or devil is going to prepare, uh, prevail against the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God has authority over all things, including everything in the spiritual realm. And so with, one, with, with just a word, be quiet and come out of him, Jesus casts this demon out of this, out of this possessed man. And everybody there realized that Jesus not only spoke with authority, but his words had power. When Jesus says something, it happens. Just like they knew of God the Father. When God the Father created the world, he said something and it came to be. He said something and it happened. All throughout Scripture, God the Father says something and it happens. And now Jesus is showing that when he says something... It, it comes to be. It happens. Jesus had all of this power. Jesus had all of this authority. And so perhaps it's instructive for us to, to see how, just how he used that power and authority. And you remember when Jesus is in the, the Garden of Gethsemane? And he knows people are coming to arrest him. And, and then they do. Judas comes and betrays him with a kiss. And, and there's a whole army of people there to arrest Jesus. Do you remember what he said to them? Don't you think I can call out down legions of angels to prevent my arrest? He says that, right? Because Jesus has all of that power and all of that authority, and yet he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He used that power and authority to submit to those evil authorities at that time who wanted to arrest and kill him. He, he stood that trial that was a joke of a trial, and he went to the cross, and he could have come down from the cross. He had all the power in the, in the world to do that. But he didn't, because he used his power and authority in a way that to us looks like apparent weakness, but in a way that actually showed his amazing strength. When Jesus says something, it happens. He speaks with authority. And so with authoritative words, right before he bows his head and dies, he says, it is finished. And when Jesus said that, he has the authority to say it. And it really was finished. You were saved when Jesus died, from the, died on the cross and rose from the dead. Jesus still speaks authoritatively today. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his sacraments. He put an authoritative word on you when you were baptized. When, when a little bit of water was, was poured over your head and, and you were baptized into the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, he said, you are washed, you are clean, you have a new identity. You have the gift of faith. You have the, the Holy Spirit as a gift for you. He said that, and it happened. It looked simple, right? But it happened. When Jesus speaks, it, it happens. When, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, and he gives us the bread and the wine and his body and his blood in the Lord's Supper, and when he says, when you take of that body and blood, you receive the forgiveness of sins, you can trust that you do. Because when he says something, it happens. He speaks authoritatively today, and that's for our comfort. That's for our salvation. When it comes to teaching, it seems like there's two things that are important. The ability of the teacher and the content of their message. Jesus shows us that he is both. <laughs> he has ability that far surpasses anyone's. He has the authority to speak these things because he is God, and the content of his message is both law and gospel that works on our heart to bring us comfort, to bring us healing, to bring us peace. Listen to him. Amen. Hi there, Pastor Wilkie here. Thanks for taking time this week to, to be in the Word and to grow in your faith. We know that where the Word is preached, the Holy Spirit is working to strengthen and to create faith in the hearts of people. Now, because we know that's the case, 
Uh, and if you enjoy these sermon podcasts, we'd, we'd really love it if you'd share these with your friends. Uh, this is a, an easy way to evangelize and to get the word into people's ears. And, and as a way of also doing that, could you hit like or subscribe wherever you are listening to this podcast? This is just a way that we are able to be seen by more people so that more people may hear this gospel message. We hope you'll join us next week as we, we dive into God's word yet again. God bless.